I think my voice is enough. Good, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Dr. Swaga from uh, Dubai Pediatric Club. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Suleiman. I don't see him here to, for inviting me. Uh, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sui. Dr. Darala Sui is a consultant, pediatric developmental and neurobehavioral specialist and head of the Department of Mental Health Services at uh, his heart at Busabi. Before she start, uh, next uh, on 26th of this month we are having uh, the DPC annual conference uh, an eminent speaker, Dr. Uh, Samir Albay, who is a specialist in this field, he is giving oration on new behavioral disorders in children on 26th. Dr. Tahir and others will be there. All are invited. Thank you very much. Over to Dr. Sri. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I think um, Nancy was her name, the DCBA, I'm not sure where she is, but she gave a beautiful segue into my part of the presentation, which is the management of autism spectrum disorder. I think I have a lot of respect for all DCBAs, behavioral therapists. We couldn't do what we do without them. And so I'll just give a brief overview. Um, autism, as we all know, is a very developmental condition characterized by varying degrees of impairment and social and behavioral functioning. Um, I know that a lot of the speakers have uh, touched upon this, that early diagnosis and intervention are key uh, when it comes to managing autism spectrum disorders, and uh, management must be tailored to each patient. I'll be the fourth one to say this again. If you've seen one patient with autism, you've only seen one patient with autism. And so you have to tailor that management for each kind of patient. And it requires a multidisciplinary team approach. What that typically looks like is that um, our therapies or our management is based around or centered around the child, and then we all work together, the caregivers or parents, the primary care physicians, so our general um, pediatricians who see the patients, developmental behavioral pediatricians, neurologists, psychiatrists, as well as our therapists, of course, our speech therapists, OT, behavioral therapists, uh, along with the school. And so all of us together working towards coming up with the best, best management plan for every child. Our goals of um, kind of managing autism spectrum disorders are to improve overall social functioning of the child and play skills, adaptive skills and skills of daily living. This can include things such as toileting, getting dressed in the morning, uh, getting in and out of clothing, communication skills, whether it be verbal or nonverbal, uh, academic functioning and cognition, and it's to reduce maladaptive behaviors and negative and unwanted behaviors. So for example, I think Nancy touched upon sort of uh, head banging or other uh, maladaptive behaviors. Our key is not for a cure for autism. I, I wish that was what we did, but we are typically um, focusing on the symptoms associated with autism or the maladaptive behaviors to um, kind of target. The earlier the intervention, we talked about this, the more effective the outcome. And the treatment setting can be anywhere, whether it's in the home, sending an early intervention agency, which I'll talk about in just a second, to the home to assess the child and give the therapies in the home environment where the child is most comfortable, or whether it's in school or center-based ABA, which I believe in the UAE, a lot of the ABA therapists are practicing uh, center-based ABA. This is just an example of early intervention program. Uh, so early intervention programs in the United States are federally funded um, agencies or programs. Um, that send in what we call our clinicians or um, social, so trained social workers, speech therapists, occupational therapists, behavioral therapists to the home. They assess the child, any child between zero and three, and anyone can refer to these agencies. It can be uh, a caregiver that's concerned. It could be a teacher who brought this to the parent's attention. It could be um, a pediatrician who says, yeah, I'm, I don't feel I'm that comfortable with how this child is developing, whether it's fine motor delays, gross motor delays, um, social emotional delays, any sort of delays, or a mixture of all, or some people refer because they think that what they're seeing is autism. And it doesn't have to be that, it's any form of delay. So these people go into the home, they do a full assessment of the child, and they either say, nope, you're good, keep going with what you're doing, go into daycare, preschool, or no, I think we need to start working with the child sooner rather than later. 
and intervening earlier. Where I trained in Rhode Island, so one of the, the, it is the smallest state in the United States, we had nine different early intervention agencies. These are just a few of them, so Seven Hills, Sister Seals, looking upwards. And what was beautiful about these agencies is that every patient that came to see us for a near developmental assessment, their early intervention worker would join them to the visit. So we get a lot of the data about the child from the parents as well as these early intervention um, people. For this, during COVID, they'd um, kind of join the visits over a video call. Idea, I just wanted to um, go over this kind of law that was passed. So Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, idea. This was a law passed in the United States in the 1970s. Um, it states that every child with a disability any disability, including <laughs> autism spectrum disorder, between the ages of 3 and 21, is allowed to receive free and appropriate education. So not only is it free for um, through the public school system, it needs to be appropriate. So if parents come into the school and feel that the child isn't kind of progressing the way they want or not meeting their specific developmental goals, they have the right to intervene with their team and say, I think we need to review the goals or make these therapies more intensive for the child. Um, this is kind of my hope is to adopt a law like this worldwide, big dreams, but hopefully we're on our way there. But this is something that is that has been going on in the United States since the 1970s. So when we're talking about treatment modalities for ASD, um, we kind of split them into categories, but we need to remember one thing, that all of these therapies or uh, interventions that we do come hand in hand. So when we talk about behavioral and education interventions, we also talk about, for not all, but some, psychopharmacological interventions, so medication management, and then complementary and alternative medicine. So all of these things come hand in hand. Some children could be receiving behavioral and education interventions, but we can also add on their medication therapies, and then um, comes into play count or complementary alternative therapies that we'll talk about in just a sec. Um, so for educational interventions, um, when we talk about a classroom or um, a special education program for children with autism, we look for specific features. Inclusion is a big thing worldwide, everywhere, and nationwide in the United States. Inclusion is key because they have the um, modeling of their neurotypical um, peers in the classroom for um, social skills, for communication skills. Um, sometimes we do recommend, although not usually, but for a um, smaller group of patients with um, lower cognitive abilities, we'll recommend our self-contained or smaller classrooms, so more one-on-one -on -one help. However, within the inclusive inclusion classroom setting, we can also recommend that a shadow teacher go in with the, with the patient to allow for that inclusion environment, but also have that one-on-one -on -one help. So you get the best of both worlds, if appropriate. It all depends on the child's cognitive level um, and overall core symptoms of ASD and what, what's best for them. An IEP, Individualized Education Program, this is key. Every child with autism, where I trained, of course, and I'm, I'm hoping this will be similar here, we'll see, um, but an individualized education program, which is a um, education program that's tailored for the child to work on their specific needs and to work on their specific problematic behaviors also. So not just their educational needs, but it could be their com communication needs, it could be their behavioral needs. We need a well-trained staff, so staff that's familiar with children um, with any neurodiversity, including autism, um, consistent services, and then ongoing program evaluation and response to treatment. It's not a one-time thing. Here's what the child needs, see you later, I'll see you in three years. Definitely not appropriate. In the next few months, we need feedback, whether it's from the teachers, whether it's from the, um, the uh, parents. What's going on? Is the child responding to plan A, B, C, D, E? If he's not, what can we be doing better? Should we be giving more intensive therapies? Does the child need further therapies at home and at school? Do we need to go to a center in addition to that? So always reevaluating to make sure we're on the right track. Um, some ABA-based programs can also be implemented in schools. And also something very important to remember is predictability and structure of these programs. We're dealing with a group of children who, um, at their core, kind of uh, thrive on rigidity and kind of their structure. And so we need to work according to that. If it's inconsistent services, you're going to get your inconsistent results as well. Um, overall, for children less than three years, we do recommend early intervention programs in any form. It doesn't have to be through just those agencies that we're talking about, but intervening early. The sooner, the better. Um, and it's school age children are going to pre-K and K, um, special education classrooms, inclusion classrooms, and center-based ABA. 
I won't go over ABA because I know Nancy did a wonderful job of talking about that and I appreciate that because she went into more details. I'll touch upon some of the psychopharmacological interventions. I feel like this could be a lecture on its own. Um, it is very, very detailed um, and kind of, we talk about treating the symptoms of autism and not necessarily treating autism itself. It's always the symptoms that we're uh, dealing with because a lot of the kids that come to see us with autism have comorbid conditions. It could, this could be anything like ADHD. So 50 to 60% of the patients we see have comorbid ADHD. Aggression, self-injurious behaviors, so SIV, anxiety, OCD behaviors, rigidity, depressive symptoms, sleep dysfunction, huge sleep dysfunction, 50 to 80 percent of our patients that we see. It's a huge concern when patients come in. Um, we use medication when behavior impedes function and progress in educational program. So it does not mean that child A, child B, child C all have autism, everyone needs to be on medication. No, that's not a good practice. It's always tailored to each and every patient. And what is the problematic symptom they're coming with? What are we targeting? Is it your sleep? Is it your hyperactivity? Are you aggressive at home? Or are you fine? You're, you're fine, you're flapping in the corner, it's okay. There's some stereotypes there, but there's nothing else to treat. It's not really impeding functioning. It may look strange to parents at times, but we always ask the question, who is this bothering? Is it bothering you, the, the parents? Is it bothering the child? Is it bothering baby functioning? Let's work together to figure out what's going on and who are we treating and what are we treating. Um, to remember that autistic patients can be more sensitive to side effects. So my model typically when treating patients with any form of medication, start low and then go slow. Start at your lowest dose and then go up accordingly. Um, different groups of medications, again, I, I won't go into significant details into this because there's just so much, this is a world on its own, but we can use things like stimulant therapies to um, target um, hyperactivity, inattentive symptoms, alpha-dynergic agonists, so not only for aggressive behaviors, but also sometimes used for sleep when um, melatonin is not really that sufficient or when sleep hygiene isn't, um, isn't really working. Um, things like SNRIs or atypical antipsychotics, typically used for more of the aggressive behaviors or behavioral dysfunction. Um, for sleep dysfunction, I, I put a separate slide for this just because I, I tend to see this a lot at my clinic. It's very, very, very prevalent. Um, it's so sleep dysfunction is common among children with autism spectrum disorders. Um, it's it's seen to be linked to abnormal melatonin synthesis and release. Not only is it a problem with sleep onset, sometimes it's sleep onset, so they have trouble falling asleep. Sometimes it's sleep latency, so having difficulty staying asleep. And sometimes it's early morning waking. My child sleeps at night, but he's up at four. That's it. That's all he'll get. And then I have to wake up at four, and I have to be with my child. And so. We're, we're kind of getting more history as to which part of sleep is the problem. What we focus on initially, because we don't want to just be throwing our medications onto patients, we're dealing with a very sensitive group of medications and children at the end of the day, um, we focus on sleep hygiene. So coming up with a sort of behavioral plan. What's going on around bedtime? This can be something we can target with ABA as well. So our ABA therapists are with us all the time. Um, what's going on around bedtime? Is it a dark room? Or is the child sitting there with an iPad or a phone and he's not falling asleep or needs that screen time before falling asleep? So figuring out exactly what's going on in the home environment. One of the things we can resort to is melatonin and it's effective for sleep onset, not necessarily for sleep latency or for that early morning waking where we'll need to resort to other medications. But again, key here, sleep hygiene and coming up with that behavioral plan for sleep for around bedtime. Big topic, a big hot topic all over, I feel, is complementary alternative medicine, or CAM. Um, this is a group of diverse medical and healthcare sy systems and practices and products that are not presently considered to be part of conventional medicine. I don't like the word alternative. I like the word complementary, um, especially with these things, because I don't like to remove conventional medicine and alternate it with um, alternative kind of complementary therapies that are non-conventional because I feel if they if it doesn't harm the child and it can work be, be working with the child hand in hand then we don't need to replace one we can complement another it is used by almost 27 to 88 percent of children with ASD and believe it or not you you cannot imagine the number of parents that come in that won't voluntarily or spontaneously give you that information so here is where we have the importance of, of creating a rapport with a family gaining that trust because 
believe me, they are worried about your judgment more than anything because you're going to sit there and recommend something else or you're going to judge them for using a specific herb or supplement or diet. And so building that rapport and that relationship with the parents is super, super, super important for them to kind of um, have that confidence in you to help them with the management plans. Why do some families choose complementary alternative medicine? They, they see lack of efficacy of the conventional medical treatment. So they'll come in and say, doctor, none of your medications don't work, none of your, but my neighbor's child used this kind of herb and they're doing fine, so that's what I'm gonna do. Well and good, if it's not harmful to the child, no problem. The only thing is, we don't have any evidence-based data with a lot of these um, alternative methods. So I'd say if it's not harmful, good. If it's harmful though, we need to have that conversation. There's a hope for a cure, so families are desperate for that cure. The desire to try everything, so I've tried conventional and non-conventional methods, nothing's worked. Attempt to address biological conditions, thought to cause ASD, so some of uh, the probiotics that uh, work on the uh, gut um, bacteria and things like that, or reports of efficacy from other parents, whether they've had another child um, with a neurodisability disability or neighbors, cousins, so forth, or prior favorable experience with CAM. Types of CAM, again, a lecture on its own. Um, this could be anything like vitamins, minerals, supplements, off-label medications, probiotics, other medical treatments, chelation therapy, hyperbaric therapy, um, and dietary modification. Again, no evidence-based data. There's so much research out there. And if you open up Google and type in alternative methods of treating autism, you'll find so many. And that's a beautiful thing about our practice is that parents will come in and give you that research. And believe it or not, I will sit there at night and read through it because it's really interesting to see what's out there. You never know, maybe one day it will be evidence-based, but it's nice to stay updated so that you support your families as well that come in. Dietary modification, so time is over. Oh, not all over, okay. Um, dietary modifications, so um, gluten or casein-free diets, big thing, um, hot topic as well. Um, it's a healthy diet. I don't know if there are any GI people in here. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a dietary person, but gluten casein free diet is healthy overall. Um, however, um, you need to be very, very careful. I always tell families, if that's something you're going to opt to do, work with a nutritionist. Make sure the child is getting the dietary um, kind of nutrition that they need because remember, we're already dealing with children who are super, super picky. A lot of their diets is high in carbohydrates and high in gluten and casein. So when you're removing that, you're moving to more towards malnutrition. So you need to keep that balance in there. So gluten casein free, well and good, it's healthy if you can afford it and if you're gonna work with a nutritionist as well to make sure that the, that the diet is balanced. So a general pediatrician's role is just to create surveillance for comorbidities. It can be intimidating to see a child with autism. It can be scary. But remember, you're backed up by people that have a, or, or are specialized in developmental pediatrics, neurologists, psychiatrists. So just work as the surveillance system. Do they have comorbid hyperactivity, sleep problems? If you're not comfortable managing it, refer out. Be the access to their care and make the appropriate referrals for the families. And provide support. Common caregiver concerns I'll see at the clinic. Um, will they go to college? Um, when will they speak? Lots of guilt. This is something I caused. What can we do to help? A lot of these concerns come up at the clinic. Um, it's sad to see at times because there's a lot of guilt associated with that and can sometimes break down families, but we always, always emphasize on the importance of keeping the family together to support the child. I always tell my patients, I wish I had a crystal ball to kind of look into the future and let you know what your child's gonna look like. I wish we all did, but unfortunately we do not. But what we do know is there are some prognostic factors. We all agree, I think, at this point, that the earlier the intervention, the better the outcomes. Positive markers that we look at, that we can see in some children that may give us a better or a more positive outcome is the presence of joint attention. So having that interaction between the child and the caregivers where they're sharing that interest, that attention. Functional play skills, higher cognitive abilities, early diagnosis, and inclusion with typical peers as models for them. Less favorable prognostic factors, lack of joint attention by age four, lack of functional speech. Again, here we need to highlight functional speech, not echolalic speech, not just repetitive speech, but functional speech by the age of five. IQ less than 70, so a comorbid intellectual disability diagnosis, multiple comorbid conditions, and severe core ASD symptoms. Our role is always to respect the patient's point of view. Let them trust you. Have them give you that information that you can use to help their children. Reassure them. 
guide them as to what they need with regards to management strategies, with regards to where they can refer them to, to the specific therapies, and support the family as much as we can. Thank you very much.